Hey, New Heights, it is Easter Sunday. I'm not gonna be able to hear you, but where you're at, just give a big a holler, woo! Hey, we're so glad that you are here this morning. Um, guys, we have an amazing opportunity this morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're gonna talk about it a little bit later, um, about there are probably some of us right now who are just feeling like, Ugh, we can't be at the church building for Easter. It's such a, a foreign and an odd experience for, for all of us right now. But Lord, uh, uh, guys, the, the, the truth is that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And even in the midst of being in our homes this morning and not being together, we have every reason to celebrate, to be happy, and to be joyful. Uh, I wanna remind you of a few things this morning. If you are joining us and wherever you're joining us, there are a, a number of links that can be in places. If you're on Facebook and you're on YouTube, there are links in the description uh, for the video that you can click on. Uh, if you wanna connect with us, if you're new and you're a guest with us this morning, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, but here's my suggestion, don't be anonymous. We wanna connect with you. We wanna know you and, uh, and just be able to know you more. And so uh, click on a connect card there. Uh, also, there's our, our link for our giving. Again, we, one thing we're trying to say through all of this is we continue to do ministry here at this church. It's not stopped for us. And so we need to make sure that we continue to be faithful and giving of things that God has given to us and making that uh, our gift to God. And so uh, that link is there as well. There's links to uh, the children's programming for this morning and a number of other things that you can ch uh, check on there. Our online Bible study or Bible reading plan. Uh, take a look at that. If you're on the online church platform, super easy for you. It's just up there in the corner. All of those links will be available for you uh, at the same time. I also want to let you know this morning we have something super exciting uh, that I hope you guys are really going to enjoy. One of the things uh, that I have kind of grieved about uh, the most and that I think that our worship team is grieving about the most over these last few weeks is that we've not been able to be together uh, and experience our worship team. And man, we just love our worship team so much here at New Heights and the work that they do and the passion that they have for, for worshiping God. And so this morning, got a little bit of a surprise for you. I'm only going to say it with this. We have, through the power of technology, been able to try to bring our worship team together in the best way that we know how to. And so we hope that your worship this morning uh, will be super inspiring, super encouraging. But again, thank you so much for being here this morning. And you have a great time as you listen to so many things and experience so many different things this morning. We've got our worship team. We have some, some testimonies this morning. Our people talking about why the resurrection is so amazing. You hear that from uh, your own people at New Heights this morning. So so again, thank you for being here uh, and uh, have a great morning. Don't forget to check out the uh, YouTube channel for Rise Kids. Find the link below in the description. So join us Friday nights at 7 p.m. on Zoom. For more information, contact Levi.
in New Heights. It is Easter Sunday. I'm not gonna be able to hear you, but where you're at, just give a big holler. Woo! Hey, we're so glad that you are here this morning. Um, guys, we have an amazing opportunity this morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're gonna talk about it a little bit later, um, about there are probably some of us right now who are just feeling like, Ugh, we can't be at the church building for Easter. It's such a, a foreign and an odd experience for, for all of us right now. But Lord, uh, uh, guys, the, the, the truth is that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And even in the midst of being in our homes this morning and not being together, we have every reason to celebrate, to be happy and to be joyful. Uh, I wanna remind you of a few things this morning. If you are joining us and wherever you're joining us, there are a, a number of links that can be in places. If you're on Facebook and you're on YouTube, there are links in the description uh, for the video that you can click on. Uh, if you wanna connect with us, if you're new and you're a guest with us this morning, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, but here's my suggestion, don't be anonymous. We wanna connect with you. We wanna know you and, uh, and just be able to know you more. And so uh, click on a connect card there. Uh, also, there's our, our link for our giving. Again, we, one thing we're trying to say through all of this is we continue to do ministry here at this church. It's not stopped for us. And so we need to make sure that we continue to be faithful and giving the things that God has given to us and making that uh, our gift to God. And so uh, that link is there as well. There's links to uh, the children's programming for this morning and a number of other things that you can ch uh, check on there. Our online Bible study or Bible reading plan. Uh, take a look at that. If you're on the online church platform, super easy for you. It's just up there in the corner. All of those links will be available for you uh, at the same time. I also want to let you know this morning we have something super exciting uh, that I hope you guys are really going to enjoy. One of the things uh, that I have kind of grieved about uh, the most and that I think that our worship team is grieving about the most over these last few weeks is that we've not been able to be together uh, and experience our worship team. And man, we just love our worship team so much here at New Heights and the work that they do and the passion that they have for, for worshiping God. And so this morning, got a little bit of a surprise for you. I'm only going to say it with this. We have, through the power of technology, been able to try to bring our worship team together in the best way that we know how to. And so we hope that your worship this morning uh, will be super inspiring, super encouraging. But again, thank you so much for being here this morning. And you have a great time as you listen to so many things and experiences so many different things this morning. We've got our worship team. We have some, some testimonies this morning. Our people talking about why the resurrection is so amazing. You hear that from uh, your own people at New Heights this morning. So again, thank you for being here uh, and uh, have a great morning. Kids, don't forget to check out the uh, YouTube channel for Rise Kids. Find the link below in the description. students join us Friday nights at 7 p.m. on Zoom. For more information, contact Levi.
Hey, New Heights, it is Easter Sunday. I'm not gonna be able to hear you, but where you're at, just give a big a holler, woo! Hey, we're so glad that you are here this morning. Um, Guys, we have an amazing opportunity this morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about it a little bit later, um, about there are probably some of us right now who are just feeling like, Ugh, we can't be at the church building for Easter. It's such a, a foreign and an odd experience for, for all of us right now. But Lord, uh, guys, the, the, the truth is that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And even in the midst of being in our homes this morning and not being together, we have every reason to celebrate, to be happy, and to be joyful. Uh, I want to remind you of a few things this morning. If you're joining us and wherever you're joining us, there are a, a number of links that can be in places. If you're on Facebook and you're on YouTube, there are links in the description uh, for the video that you can click on. Uh, if you want to connect with us, if you're new and you're a guest with us this morning, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, but Here's my suggestion, don't be anonymous. We wanna connect with you. We wanna know you and, uh, and just be able to know you more. And so uh, click on a connect card there. Uh, also, there's our, our link for our giving. Again, we, one thing we're trying to say through all of this is we continue to do ministry here at this church. It's not stopped for us. And so we need to make sure that we continue to be faithful and giving the things that God has given to us and making that uh, our gift to God. And so uh, that link is there as well. There's links to uh, the children's programming for this morning and a number of other things that you can ch uh, check on there. Our online Bible study or Bible reading plan. Uh, take a look at that. If you're on the online church platform, super easy for you. It's just up there in the corner. All of those links will be available for you uh, at the same time. I also want to let you know this morning we have something super exciting uh, that I hope you guys are really going to enjoy. One of the things uh, that I have kind of grieved about uh, the most and that I think that our worship team is grieving about the most over these last few weeks is that we've not been able to be together uh, and experience our worship team. And man, we just love our worship team so much here at New Heights and the work that they do and the passion that they have for, for worshiping God. And so this morning, got a little bit of a surprise for you. I'm only going to say it with this. We have, through the power of technology, been able to try to bring our worship team together in the best way that we know how to. And so we hope that your worship this morning uh, will be super inspiring, super encouraging. But again, thank you so much for being here this morning. And you have a great time as you listen to so many things and experience so many different things this morning. We've got our worship team. We have some, some testimonies this morning. Our people talking about why the resurrection is so amazing. You hear that from uh, your own people at New Heights this morning. So so again, thank you for being here uh, and uh, have a great morning. Kids, don't forget to check out the uh, YouTube channel for Rise Kids. Find the link below in the description. So join us Friday nights at 7 p.m. on Zoom. For more information, contact Levi.
New Heights. It is Easter Sunday. I'm not gonna be able to hear you, but where you're at, just give a big holler. Woo! Hey, we're so glad that you are here this morning. Um, guys, we have an amazing opportunity this morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're gonna talk about it a little bit later, um, about there are probably some of us right now who are just feeling like, Ugh, we can't be at the church building for Easter. It's such a, a foreign and an odd experience for, for all of us right now. But Lord, uh, uh, guys, the, the, the truth is that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And even in the midst of being in our homes this morning and not being together, we have every reason to celebrate, to be happy, and to be joyful. Uh, I want to remind you of a few things this morning. If you are joining us and wherever you're joining us, there are a, a number of links that can be in places. If you're on Facebook and you're on YouTube, there are links in the description uh, for the video that you can click on. Uh, if you want to connect with us, if you're new and you're a guest with us this morning, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, but here's my suggestion. Don't be anonymous. We want to connect with you. We want to know you and, uh, and just be able to know you more. And so uh, click on a connect card there. Uh, also, there's our, our link for our giving. Again, we, one thing we're trying to say through all of this is we continue to do ministry here at this church. It's not stopped for us. And so we need to make sure that we continue to be faithful and giving of things that God has given to us and making that uh, our gift to God. And so uh, that link is there as well. There's links to uh, the children's programming for this morning and a number of other things that you can ch check on there. Our online Bible study or Bible reading plan. Uh, take a look at that. If you're on the online church platform, super easy for you. It's just up there in the corner. All of those links will be available for you uh, at the same time. I also want to let you know this morning we have something super exciting uh, that I hope you guys are really going to enjoy. One of the things uh, that I have kind of grieved about uh, the most and that I think that our worship team is grieving about the most over these last few weeks is that we've not been able to be together uh, and experience our worship team. And man, we just love our worship team so much here at New Heights and the work that they do and the passion that they have for, for worshiping God. And so this morning, got a little bit of a surprise for you. I'm only going to say it with this. We have, through the power of technology, been able to try to bring our worship team together in the best way that we know how to. And so we hope that your worship this morning uh, will be super inspiring, super encouraging. But again, thank you so much for being here this morning. And you have a great time as you listen to so many things and experiences so many different things this morning. We've got our worship team. We have some, some testimonies this morning. Our people talking about why the resurrection is so amazing. You hear that from uh, your own people at New Heights this morning. So again, thank you for being here uh, and uh, have a great morning. Kids, don't forget to check out the uh, YouTube channel for Rise Kids. Find the link below in the description. students join us Friday nights at 7 p.m. on Zoom. For more information, contact Levi.
Hey, New Heights, it is Easter Sunday. I'm not gonna be able to hear you, but where you're at, just give a big holler, woo! Hey, we're so glad that you are here this morning. Um, guys, we have an amazing opportunity this morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're gonna talk about it a little bit later, um, about there are probably some of us right now who are just feeling like, Ugh, we can't be at the church building for Easter. It's such a, a foreign and an odd experience for, for all of us right now. But Lord, uh, uh, guys, the, the, the truth is that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And even in the midst of being in our homes this morning and not being together, we have every reason to celebrate, to be happy, and to be joyful. Uh, I wanna remind you of a few things this morning. If you are joining us and wherever you're joining us, there are a, a number of links that can be in places. If you're on Facebook and you're on YouTube, there are links in the description uh, for the video that you can click on. Uh, if you wanna connect with us, if you're new and you're a guest with us this morning, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, but here's my suggestion, don't be anonymous. We wanna connect with you. We wanna know you and, uh, and just be able to know you more. And so uh, click on a connect card there. Uh, also, there's our, our link for our giving. Again, we, one thing we're trying to say through all of this is we continue to do ministry here at this church. It's not stopped for us. And so we need to make sure that we continue to be faithful and giving of things that God has given to us and making that uh, our gift to God. And so uh, that link is there as well. There's links to uh, the children's programming for this morning and a number of other things that you can ch uh, check on there. Our online Bible study or Bible reading plan. Uh, take a look at that. If you're on the online church platform, super easy for you. It's just up there in the corner. All of those links will be available for you uh, at the same time. I also want to let you know this morning we have something super exciting uh, that I hope you guys are really going to enjoy. One of the things uh, that I have kind of grieved about uh, the most and that I think that our worship team is grieving about the most over these last few weeks is that we've not been able to be together uh, and experience our worship team. And man, we just love our worship team so much here at New Heights and the work that they do and the passion that they have for, for worshiping God. And so this morning, got a little bit of a surprise for you. I'm only going to say it with this. We have, through the power of technology, been able to try to bring our worship team together in the best way that we know how to. And so we hope that your worship this morning uh, will be super inspiring, super encouraging. But again, thank you so much for being here this morning. And you have a great time as you listen to so many things and experience so many different things this morning. We've got our worship team. We have some, some testimonies this morning. Our people talking about why the resurrection is so amazing. You hear that from uh, your own people at New Heights this morning. So so again, thank you for being here uh, and uh, have a great morning. Don't forget to check out the uh, YouTube channel for Rise Kids. Find the link below in the description. So join us Friday nights at 7 p.m. on Zoom. For more information, contact Levi.
family and happy Easter. A few months ago a couple friends came over for dinner and after dinner we were sharing some uh, comedy videos uh, that were online and one particular was from George Carlin and you can't share most of George Carlin's up things but this particular one was about words in the English language that we sometimes change to be softer. Um, it's particularly about military and the mental wounds that some soldiers have. Um, most of us know this as PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. And probably not a topic you would think of for a communion meditation, but um, we were trying to figure out how to use some of these words in a communion meditation. Um, so for example, one of the first ones was in World War I, they called it shell shock. And in the Korean War, it was operational exhaustion. But the one that kind of, uh, kind of came out the best and uh, tried to, we were trying to fit it into a community meditation was uh, World War II was battle fatigue. And it was such a, a strange term, but also seemed so uh, relevant, especially for today and today's world and what's happening. Um, as we miss our church family, as we feel disconnected, we can get our own personal battle fatigue. But I wanted to share something of mine uh, personally. Um, I'm at home, I'm on Facebook, there's not a lot to do. So you, you get on there and you try to be as positive as possible. But I ran into some friends that uh, aren't Christian and um, they were attacking not only churches, but Christians in general, and it got to me, and I felt a little battle fatigued, um, and I, I usually have that armor of faith, and, and the word is the, the sword, but uh, I definitely was down. So as we have our own personal battle fatigue, I want to share a few things here. Matthew 5, verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Also, 2 Timothy 3.12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So that struck me is that um, knowing that I am a Christian, knowing that I will be persecuted, that it, we know there's a place for us in heaven because of the good news. 
because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made at the cross. And I just pray that all of us can take our stresses, our battle fatigue, and lay them at the foot of the cross. And as we come to the table with both wine or whatever you're using, juice, crackers, um, that you can, t that Jesus can take away that battle fatigue. Uh, just let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for this church family. And at this particular time, Lord, where we just feel so out of sorts, we feel frustrated, we stressed that we have this battle fatigue, Lord. I just pray that knowing that you are there for us, um, that you are the one that we need to look to. And, and just I just pray that you take all this away and that you can uh, the, let us know that you are God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
thought of when I read the first question, what does Jesus' sacrifice mean to you? Um, the first thing that popped into my head was the word love. Uh, I feel like that's really obvious, um, but I thought of the verse in John. So it's John 15, 13, where it says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Um, and so that's what made me think of the word love. And, you know, he, what baffles me is just that Jesus lived among us, right? So he lived right next to us. He walked with us. He saw our humanity. He saw it up close and personal. Um, he witnessed our flaws and he was even a victim so many times of our sin-filled nature and our depravity. And he still, even, even with all of that, he still went and died on the cross for us. He still chose to die on the cross for us. And there is nothing that could explain that except just this unfathomable and endless and just huge love. Um, it also means to me that um, I've been given new life and it's one that I don't deserve. Um, but I've been given that. I've been given that chance. I've been given that hope and that freedom and that forgiveness in Him. So the second question is, how does the cross impact your life? Um, I started by making a list of things. So I said, um, I can live with true hope. I can live with true joy. I mean, it's joy that only comes from knowing and having a relationship with God. Um, I can live with God's peace in my heart, and there's hardly any feeling that's better than that. Um, you know, I am fully known and fully loved. I am righteous because He lives in my heart. I am chosen and I am worthy, and um, you know, that does affect the way that I live. And I think like the true beauty of it is that I know that I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to live a perfect life. He doesn't come to me at the end of the day and say, well, you know, I gave you a chance. You really blew it today. So I guess you'll just have to, you know, try again. So, um, no, what he does is, you know, we go to him, we're like, I really messed up big time. And, you know, I need forgiveness. And he says, you know, I love you. And I'm going to give you more mercy. I'm going to give you more grace. I'm going to give you more love. And I think that really the biggest way that the cross impacts my life is that I strive to emulate that to everyone that I meet. And like I said, you know, the great thing is I don't have to be perfect. Like I know I'm going to mess up, but all I have to do is go to him and he'll say, you know what? You're forgiven. Here's more love. Here's more grace. Here's more mercy. You know, so I think that that is the biggest impact for me personally. Hey guys, as we already said this morning, uh, happy Easter morning or happy Resurrection Sunday. And uh, there have been a lot of things that have been going through my mind uh, the last few weeks. And knowing, uh, even from the beginning of this whole social distancing thing, knowing that really and truly probably Easter was going to look very different uh, for us and for the church as a whole uh, this year. Um, and, and I think there's a part of me um, and I think there's a part of all of us where we just kind of like, well, yeah, we're just going to continue on and we're just going to keep doing things the way it is. And you know what, Easter will be a little bit different, but we'll be okay. Um, but then there's this also this other side of us that really just grieves uh, that we can't be together as a church, as a family uh, for Easter. And I got to thinking of myself, and I think that sometimes there's this uh, tendency as a leader to be like the, you know, the stoic one that we should like be super happy about everything, and we should just tell people, don't worry about that, and just just look and 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 be positive about things, and and we should do that. We should have joy in all things in every situation, as Paul tells us to do. Um, but I think that at the same time, there there's some rare, very real grief uh, in, in in how things are going right now, and kind of just the Ah, the struggle and the tension that we have uh, in in the moment, um, and, and I think um, I think it's healthy uh, to have that, and I think for it, it's healthy for us to say, "Hey, things aren't going to be the same." But I also think that we have to keep things in perspective and, and realize this: 
And this is one thing that struck me, especially on a day like today where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. If you think back to the first disciples and what they were experiencing in the moment uh, that Jesus was on a cross, that he was put into a tomb, and that he was sitting in this tomb, and you think to yourself, what were the disciples doing? And if you read scripture and you read it closely enough, what you really see is that the disciples are freaking out. And they don't know what's going on. They're frustrated, they're angry, they're sad, they're good. A, a whole host of emotions that are going through these guys and these, these ladies uh, in this moment. And I think to myself, really and truly, aren't we kind of just probably in a time like any other uh, in our lives, more close to the disciples now than we have ever been celebrating Easter. I mean, look at what, where we are. We're, we're isolated. We're, we're, we're kind of scattered and away from each other. Uh, we're wondering how things are going to turn out. We're wondering when all this is going to end, uh, really and truly. We're wondering all these things. And I think that we are really closer to the disciples in this moment, the first followers of Jesus in this moment than we ever have been uh, on an Easter Sunday. And I think it's very interesting uh, that we, we can lament and we can grieve all we want. We can hang our head all we want that, oh, well, we won't be able to be in a church building for Easter, but we could still be the church for Easter. And we can still celebrate the resurrection of what Christ has done and overcoming death, sin, the power of the grave, guilt, shame, all of those things. And one of the things that really crossed my mind and, and something that has just kind of been in my mind that I could not let go of and I wanted to play off a little bit this morning and talk about was this concept of, of emptiness. And I want you to think about emptiness for just a moment. I, th I want you to think about the moments in life where you have felt very empty uh, about something, whether that be emotionally um, or like I just, you guys know it if, you, if you're here at New Heights often, um, I'm a person who is operated by my stomach. Uh, so when my stomach is empty, it's not good for Ryan or probably anybody around me. Uh, if I mean, just think about this. If you were to open up your like Twinkie wrapper and there were no Twinkies in the wrapper, it was empty, what would your feeling be? Anger, sadness, a lot of those things. And, and so I think of this concept of, of em emptiness and I think about how empty is really not good. It's not the way that things are supposed to be. Um, and, and I really think about this, and if you really look at the Bible, I had a chance to do this this week, is if you look from even the very beginning of Scripture, there is this, there's this theme of emptiness that comes up over and over again that no matter what we try to do in life, what we try to satisfy ourselves with, whatever we try to pursue in life, we always tend to come up empty on things. In fact, if you go to Genesis chapter one and you read verse two, at the very beginning of the account of creation, it says the earth was formless and what's that word there? Empty. And my translation of the Bible says the earth was formless and empty. If you continue on a little bit in God's story, you would go to uh, the book of Deuteronomy and Deuteronomy 32, uh, verses 9 and 10, it has this to say. It says, The people of Israel belong to the Lord. They were his special possession. It says here in verse 10, He found them in a desert land, in an empty and howling wasteland. There's this sense of emptiness even in Israel's history that as they wandered through the wilderness, they were God's people, but they were just kind of experiencing things in a very empty sort of way. Listen to what it says, though, in, in verse 10, right after that. It says, He, God, surrounded them and watched over them. He guarded them as He would guard His own eyes. So even in that emptiness, God is there surrounding His people, giving them comfort, giving them joy, giving them hope. Another, if we continue on, I just want to continue on going kind of through the, the Old Testament here, and you look in the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, verse 20, 21. If you don't know the story of Ruth, Ruth loses her husband and both of her sons in the land that she's in. They're experiencing drought anyways, and they have to move away to a foreign land. She loses everything. And it comes in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 1, and it says uh, the people you know, are asking, hey, is this Naomi? Is she back? And, and it says here, don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, which means bitter, for the Almighty has made my life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home, what's the word there again? Empty. 
And really to me, Ruth is an interesting book in and of itself because it comes uh, on the heels of one of Israel's darkest times. If you look back and if you have your Bible out in front of you, the book that comes before Ruth is Judges. And in my mind, as you read through the Old Testament, Judges has to be right up there in the top one, two, or three darkest periods and moments of Israel's history. And Ruth is written on the heels of that. And you catch that emptiness at the very beginning of Ruth chapter 1. Uh, if you continue on throughout the Old Testament, you look at the prophets, and so many of the, uh, the prophets use uh, uh, the phrase that Israel or Jerusalem are, are empty, that they will be empty, that they will be desolate uh, in, in, in sins that they have um, you know, committed. Uh, and, and gone through in their life. And then what happens as you continue on and go through all the Old Testament, you catch this theme of emptiness, is that at a certain point you, you turn a corner. And specifically, you, you turn a corner in, in, in passages like Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, 18 says this, For the Lord is God, and He created the heavens and earth, and He put everything in place. He made the world to be lived in, not to be a place of empty chaos. I am the Lord, he says, and there is no other. You see, God did not make this world. He did not make uh, creation to be lived in, order, in, in disorder and in chaos and in emptiness. That's the brokenness uh, that we live in, in, in this world and in this life. But there's a corner that's being turned here saying that's, it's not the way that things are supposed to be. We're not supposed to be this way. And then you get a book like Lamentations. Lamentations, I mean, it says it all in the name. It's all about lamenting. It's all about sorrow. It's all about an emptiness that we feel. And the author goes through the first couple verses and into the, uh, the first couple chapters and into the third chapter. And he comes to a point in verse 20 of chapter 3 and he says this. He goes, I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. And again, this is why I think the Bible is so relevant. And I don't want to over-spiritualize what we're going through right now in, in, in our community and in our state and our country and across the world with this pandemic. But like this really has really rocked a lot of people. It's sent us kind of spiraling a little bit. And that's why I think the Bible is so relevant because the words that the author of Lamentation speaks here, I think we can kind of say ourselves, I will never forget what I'm going through right now. I grieve over the loss of so many things, of being around family, of, of not experiencing a graduation, of not experiencing being with my school friends, of not experiencing being around uh, my neighbors and my colleagues, and all these things that we feel like we've lost. And then listen to what the author of Lamentation says in verse 21, yet I d still dare to hope when I remember this, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease, or as other translations say, His mercies are new every single morning. And then we sort of, we come to the end of the Old Testament here, and uh, this was very interesting to me in kind of my study. I came across uh, the story of an Old Testament prophet whose name was uh, Habakkuk. And if you don't know and haven't heard of Habakkuk, don't worry, most people probably have not. I'm not even sure. Uh, there may have been like, I can count probably on my hand the number of times that I've, I've preached or referenced a verse from the book of Habakkuk. But there's something really interesting about the book of Habakkuk, and that is the fact that the, the prophet was, was in, in a time in Israel's history where he was foreseeing what would happen to them. And there was nothing but death and destruction and despair uh, that, that was happening in the land or would be happening in the land of Israel and, and in Judah. And, and he comes and he says at the end of Habakkuk, and starting at verse 16, you can kind of catch um, the situation that he's in, the trouble that he's in. He says in verse 16 of chapter 3 in Habakkuk, I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My legs gave way beneath me, and I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. And he says this, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the field lies empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. Guys, this is a, this is a nasty situation. This is a dire situation. He says, even though and in spite of all of that, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. You know, in, in almost every instance of emptiness, it's, it's cast in a very negative light. 
until we get to the end of the Old Testament, and especially as we move into the New Testament, and specifically the Gospels, where emptiness, guys, and here's what I want you to hear this morning, emptiness is the best news that we could ever hear when it comes to the New Testament, and when it comes to Jesus, and his death, and being placed in his tomb, and his resurrection. And we know the story pretty well, and quite well, if you've read it before, but I want to read it this morning because that's what we're in, is the resurrection moment. John chapter 20, starting at verse 1, says this, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. That's John. She said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb, and they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and ran, reached the tomb first. And he stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings, wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw, and I love what this says, he saw and he believed. Now, if you were to go over to Luke chapter 24, it tells the same story in a, from a, a, a little bit of a different perspective. And specifically, and starting at verse 9 here, it says, after the women had told the disciples that, that the tomb was empty, it says that they rushed back from the tomb to tell the 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, and so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and he ran to the tomb to look and stooping, he peered in and he saw, now listen to the, what the word is, he saw empty linen wrappings. There's that word again, emptiness. And do you see how everything is completely changed from Genesis 1 to the world was empty and formless. It was void of all life. It's not the way that God would to create it. All of this emptiness that happens throughout the Old Testament. And then we get here and in the greatest moment in all of history, in all of human history, the resurrection, as Peter looks into this and he stoops into the tomb, he sees nothing but emptiness. And it is the greatest thing that we could ever see, that he could ever see. And, and here is kind of my, my, my thesis for this morning, my big point for this morning that I want you guys to really hold on to. Guys, the, the empty tomb is the source of all of our hope. In fact, what's really interesting to me is that all of the preaching of the apostles really centered and hinged on one thing. I challenge you, like, really pay attention when you're reading, especially the New Testament, especially from Paul and Peter and these guys. Do you know what the one thing was that all of their preaching centered on? Resurrection. Jesus being risen from the dead. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says very famously, I have passed on what is of first importance that Jesus died as the scripture said and as they predicted and that he was raised to life as the scripture said and as they predicted. Guys, here, here's what I want you to see. In the resurrection and what Christ has done in, in, in defeating the grave, emptiness and the idea of emptiness is redeemed. And here's one thing that I think that we know very well right now is, is what is the one thing in life that people are looking for right now. And I think this is the one thing that people are constantly looking for in, in life, not just now in the, in the midst of this pandemic, but I think people are constantly looking for hope. They want hope, they need hope, they're desperately seeking for hope, and they place it, their hope in so many different kinds of things, but what they really want is something that they can rest their lives on, a foundation they can put their lives on. And here's the deal, guys, if, if we think that hope is in really short supply right now, and everybody's running scared, and everybody's anxious, and everybody's fearful, there has never been, and I'm gonna say this very, very seriously, there has never been a more hopeless time, humanly speaking, than when the Son of God was in the grave. We already said that. Do you know where all the disciples were when Jesus was in the grave? Behind locked doors, fearing for their life, wondering what all this was about that they had just dedicated the last years of their life to. At that point, when Jesus is in the grave, it seemed like the end. All hope is lost. I mean, even the disciples in this moment, like I said, are despairing. In fact, if you took, take one of those disciples, 
Peter, and we could talk about Peter forever, all of his flaws, all of his inconsistencies, all the things about his life that we would like to just chuckle about and laugh at, there's something amazing about Peter. And this is really the text that I want to use this morning uh, and kind of come from this morning because Peter was, man, probably just the most faithless guy at some points in Jesus' ministry, but he comes to a realization that the most real thing that he could stake his life on was the resurrection. And we come to the end of the New Testament and he writes a couple of letters. We know them as first and second Peter. And first Peter, I want to read the first 12 uh, verses of first Peter chapter one. And I want you to just listen to what Peter says and what I think happened in Peter's life and the hope that he had in his life. It says this starting in verse one of first Peter chapter one, this letter is from Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people. In other translations, it say God's elect people. It just simply means that God is, is with them. He's chosen them and he is, he is faithful to them. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And I just want to stop there for a minute. I think one thing we could really do is we look at 1 Peter, and if you read the whole thing of 1 Peter, it's really all about a group of Christians who were, who were suffering. They were suffering because they were socially dislocated. Uh, many people believe that they were probably from a poorer class of people, and so right off the bat, they weren't in the upper elite echelon of people in their society, but they had also come to faith in Jesus Christ, which further pushed them to the margins of society. And I think what's really easy is for us to say, well, we can compare our lives and some things that we go through to what they went through. I just want to say this very clearly. There, there is really no comparison between a modern 21st century person, no matter what you're going through, and a first century person who's going through persecution for their faith. I don't know about you, but probably most of us have never been persecuted for our faith. But I do think, guys, there are some things that we can take from the book of 1 Peter and what Peter learned and what Peter applied in his life that could help us in the moment of our, our trials and our anxieties. And when the world is spinning out of control and we don't know what's in control and who's in control and if it's all ever going to come back together, I think we can learn some things from 1 Peter. He's writing this to people who are foreigners in all these places that I just mentioned. Can, can we just say this, guys? In a spiritual sense, are we not foreigners? Does it not say all over the New Testament that we are foreigners and we are aliens and we are strangers on this earth? This earth is not our home. Nothing that we could put our, our, our faith in or put stock into in this world is ever going to fully satisfy us. He continues on saying in verse 2, God the Father knew you and he chose you long ago and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice there that the Trinity kind of shows up. It talks about the Father and the Spirit and the Son, Jesus Christ. And then he says here at the end of his initial greeting, may God give you more and more grace and peace. Again, timely words that we need to hear. And then he continues on, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. I want you to hear that again. Why in the world can we ever have hope in life? Why in the world can we ever feel like that we can start our lives anew and start over? It doesn't matter where you are and what you've done, what you're experiencing, how empty you feel in your life. You can start over again. How do we do that? Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Resurrection. It comes back to it again. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and honor and glory on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. And though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward of trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. 
This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. They were told their messages were not for themselves but for you, and now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. I I want you to think about for just a moment what the resurrection of Jesus meant for Peter. I mean, again, we talked about this a little bit already, but Peter's darkest hour was when Jesus died. I mean, that's when everything fell apart for Peter. It's when it fell apart for the disciples. Peter had based his whole life on the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, the triumphant one, the strong one who was going to clear out everything, make everything right, take away all the emptiness in the world. But now Jesus had died. And that that Friday and that Saturday was a time of utter and painful despair in Peter's life. And and Peter's so disappointed that you remember what happens, right? He denies even knowing Jesus. But then Sunday comes along, and we've already read the account of it. He goes to the tomb, and the tomb is, is empty. And guys, Peter sees... And I I think that we need to see right now kind of what's happening is that we're all living in kind of a Saturday, not just in this moment of a pandemic, but in the moment that we have our lives here on earth, we're all kind of living in a Saturday. We're exiles, we're foreigners, we're aliens. But really in the scope of everything, what Peter is saying here is that time is, is brief and the joy of resurrection Sunday is coming. We live that today. We live that in that moment. I hope that you have so much joy today because of what Jesus has done. But we don't just have that today. We have that for eternity. We have it for a moment when Jesus will come again and he will be here. And we get to just celebrate in that joy that he has risen from the dead. This impacts my life every day by proving to me that I am free, that I have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ when he died in the, and then was laid in the tomb and rose again on the third day, that he proved that he had power over even death. And if God has power over death, if God has power over the grave, then what's stopping me? If I believe in God, if I know that he is with me, that he is walking beside me with every step that I take, then what's stopping me from doing great, great things? Even though the resurrection happened over 2,000 years ago, it still impacts my life today because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and destroyed the grave set me free to live a life that destroys sin. My sin debt is paid. I can live a guilt-free life as I follow Jesus, serving Him by loving God and loving others. The resurrection allows me still today to gain wisdom from God's Word and to be guided by the Holy Spirit, the great comforter that Jesus promised to send Christians after His ascension. My resurrected Savior, through the power of the Holy Spirit, allows me to live a peaceful life in Christ that reflects the fruit of the Spirit. There are many prophecies throughout the Old and New Testaments concerning Christ's resurrection. Luke 24, verses 25 through 27 says, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he expanded to them in all the scriptures these things concerning him. And because of the resurrection, I am assured of my salvation. What's so amazing to me is that the resurrection occurred exactly as it was prophesied and exactly as God planned it.
J.R.R. Tolkien, he's a famous author who wrote The Lord of the Rings, and he had this really great quote and really great phrase about the resurrection. He described the resurrection as a time when every sad thing becomes untrue. My question to you this morning is, what, what if you saw your life through the lens of the cross and specifically through the lens of Jesus' resurrection? That there was a glorious Sunday morning coming when all the sad things would come untrue. An inheritance, guys, that, that Peter talks about here, that, that de death and disease and destruction and despair could never even hope to possibly touch. And then you could see how even the most painful parts of your life were working toward that end. I mean, what, what, what does that give you, guys? I mean, say it with me. If you think about that, it gives you hope. Hope is such a massive word. I was listening to a preacher that I follow a lot and listen to a lot of his sermons. His name is J.D. Greer. I quote him constantly in sermons, so you probably know his name by now. Um, but he, I was listening to one of his sermons, and, and he had this really interesting thought and this really interesting idea. I just want to kind of uh, recap a little bit of what he said in the sermon. He goes, you know, we thought we knew what this fall's election season was going to be about. That's before all of this coronavirus stuff hit. All we were thinking about was primaries and election and all, all this political things. He, he says, we thought we knew what this whole season of our life was going to be about. You may have had planned in your mind just a few weeks ago what your life was going to be about. Finishing out a school year, continuing on in your career, a possible raise, a possible promotion, an interview for something. But now, he says, most likely the election will be about who can offer hope for a better or a more prepared, a more stable economy and government system. He continues saying, once this crisis has passed, we will revisit our medical systems. We'll develop new vaccines. We'll review protocols for early containment. Individuals will, will probably resolve to save more money. Businesses will re-examine the risks they are willing to take. Most of these changes, he says, will be appropriate. But ultimately, and I want you to hear this, all earthly solutions will fail. In the final analysis, if what we're after is hope, he says, all of these changes that I just mentioned are sinking sand. They're shifty. They're faulty. They're not going to hold up when we need them the most. And here's the truth that we know um, is that probably right now, many people around you, maybe you're even your own neighbors, maybe some of your own family are feeling very scared. They're feeling very powerless. They're feeling very hopeless. And, and who knows? Again, let's just admit it and be, be honest about it. Maybe you are right now too. And, and, and we're feeling scared and we're feeling out of control and we're feeling hopeless because we've placed our faith in faulty and frail systems and saviors. And here's what Easter is really about. Easter is a reminder that Jesus is risen, that Jesus is is in control, that Jesus is sitting on his throne and he is sovereign over all things. And sure, as he walked out of that grave, he promises life to those who are living under the shadow of death. And when we guys live in the light of resurrection, we can proclaim the only hope that conquers anxiety. We can proclaim the only hope that conquers uncertainty and worry and doubts and fears and death and everything in between. And here's another thing that Peter saw in the resurrection. He saw that on the worst day where, where it looked like God was least in control, do you know what the truth was? God was actually most in control. Guys, right now when it seems like things are just kind of off kilter and spinning out of control and we're really not sure what to grab on and hold on to, it just seems like everything's chaos. God is ordering things specifically to be what they need to be. And I've got to say this with all honesty, the situation that we're living in right now is completely new to all of us. None of us have lived through a pandemic. None of us. The situation is new to us, but guess what is not new? Our calling is not new. The gospel, guys, the essence of what we are to be about as believers of Jesus Christ, the gospel is still the most important message in the world. We're still called to tell the message of the gospel. It is a gospel of love and faith and hope. 
It's precisely what we need when society is, fulfill, is, is filled with, with fear and uncertainty, which it certainly is right now. I want you to look with me really quick back at this passage in 1 Peter in chapter 1, and I want to look specifically at verse 7. In first, verses 6 and 7, actually, it says, Be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. There are, there are two really interesting words in these two verses here. Two words that, Paul, that Peter uses. He uses the word in this translation that I'm using to be truly glad, and he uses the word endure. In other translations, he would say that we need to rejoice even while we grieve the things that are going on around us. And that's really interesting when you think about it, right? Rejoicing and grieving. And these two things are put together. And we would say to ourselves, but Ryan, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. How in the world can we rejoice and also grieve? And there's really something interesting about these two words. These two verbs is what they are. At first, they are both very intense verbs. Rejoice means intense rejoicing. Later, Paul would say that it's, it's, it's exceeding joy that can barely be expressed. And the same is true about this idea of grieving. It's the Greek word lupeo. It's the same word that's used to describe Jesus as he goes to the cross, that he is, that he is grieved, that he is saddened, that he is, he is crushed. And here is what I understand about these two words and, and how these two words can, can go together is that, guys, sometimes walking with Jesus, and I would say it this way, a lot of times walking with Jesus is often simultaneously the greatest joy that you could ever experience and sometimes the deepest pain that you could ever experience in your life. And again, some of you are sitting there right now as I'm saying this and you're like, that's not even possible. How in the world is that possible? Some of you are thinking, you can't, I cannot have joy in the midst of bad circumstances. And the reason that you can't have joy in the midst of your bad certain circumstances or your uncertain circumstances is because your joy is in certain circumstances. Your joy is in when, when things go good for you, in good circumstances, in pleasant circumstances. And I think, guys, what happens so often is what happens in trials and when life gets tough and when times are tough and when we're down and we're on the mat, that reveals the places where you really don't trust God. And I think right now, and I'm being very real about this, I think a lot of us are coming face to face, with, face, to face in areas of our life where we just don't trust God, flat out. But here is what I also understand, guys, and what we really need to know, what we need to anchor our faith in, in the resurrection, is that the goodness of God goes deeper than any pain and any insecurity and any anxiety and any fear and any doubt. And because of the resurrection and what Christ has done, the great gift of hope is available to, to anyone. It's available to you to know God, to see the value of God's presence in your life, to feel the constant presence and closeness and warmth of His compassion towards you, to look destruction and despair straight in the eye and say, yet I will hope in Him. Guys, here's what I understand, and Peter would go on to say this later, I don't have time to go and read all of this, but Peter would say, God allows times of testing and trial and anxiety in life to test and to purify you. Guys, don't hate those moments. God is using those moments for good. There's a very interesting section in scripture in John chapter 11. It's the healing of Lazarus, and it really is a great parallel for the resurrection of Jesus later. In John chapter 11, it says that Lazarus is sick, and it says he's, he's living in Bethany with his sisters Mary and Martha. And it says, Lazarus becomes sick. And so the sisters send a message to Jesus and they tell him this. Now listen, this is very important. It says, Lord, your dear friend, or in other translations it says, the person who you love, Lazarus, who you love, is very sick. And in verse 4, John chapter 11, it says, when Jesus heard about this, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. 
And so, although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. That, that line really confuses me. Love has been used twice already in, these, in this short span of these verses. He loves Mary. He loves Martha. He loves Lazarus. And what decision does he make when he finds out that his good friend Lazarus is getting ready to die? He stays where he is for the next two days. You think to yourself, Jesus, what in the world are you doing? Why would you do that? He says he stays there for the next days, two days, and he says to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. And you continue on and you begin to find out why in the world Jesus would do what he's going to do. He says a little bit later in verse 14 of John chapter 11, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I'm glad that I wasn't there. Again, like, what are you saying, Jesus? I'm glad that I wasn't there, for now you will really believe. What Jesus is getting ready to do is about to, to show himself and to reveal himself for who he really is. And he later says, as he comes and he meets Mary and Martha, and he has a conversation uh, with one of them, and he reveals, he says, I am the resurrection, and I am life. And it says that, he says, do you believe this, Martha? And she says, I, I do. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. And if we would come back and we would connect this moment in John chapter 11 to 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, you can see how, how joy and how grief can sit next to each other side by side. And there are really three things that I want you to, to know and I want you to capture this morning. And this is very, very important. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Hope can exist alongside grief. Those things are not mutually exclusive. Don't ever feel that in your life, that you're less of a person or less of a Christian because you are grieving and not always having as much hope as you want to. Hope can exist alongside grief. Hope doesn't drive out grief, but hope transforms grief in the most basic sense. The other thing that I understand about hope and that the scripture really tells us in the resurrection proof is that, that hope is a choice. Our rejoicing is not a description of the feelings that we have. It's a choice of the posture of your heart, of what you know to be true, even when you don't feel it. I mean, what's the song that's super popular right now? Waymaker. Even when I don't feel it, you're moving. Even when I don't see it, you're moving. That command that Jesus gives us to have hope is probably a command that we need precisely when we least feel hope. And what I also understand is not only do, can hope exist right beside grief and, and that hope is a choice, but, but the heights of hope and what we experience in hope only comes from the depths of faith. Guys, there are only aspects of God. There's only hope that you will ever know when you are empty and when you are stripped of all your go-to schemes and all of your approaches in life. There are things that you will learn about God and his character only in your moments of testing and trial. Something that's very interesting to me as I was kind of working through some of my commentaries uh, th this week uh, was I came across one who was written by Scott McKnight. It's the New International Version application commentary. And he says this very interesting about the book of 1 Peter. He says the message of 1 Peter concerns how Christians are to live in a hostile environment. And to live in such a way that they not only endure, but they also have a lasting impact for the good of that environment. What he's really saying there is not that we go through things and we just merely survive it, but in the midst of things that are foreign to us, things that are tough for us, things that are testing and stretching us and challenging us, that we don't just survive, but that we thrive in those moments. And what really has been a question that has, has gone on for all of church history has been to answer the question, how should we then live? That's the question of 1 Peter. How should we live in the midst of suffering if you're in suffering? How should we live in the midst of, of trial and pain and, and disorder and chaos and confusion? The question, guys, is no different in our day. In the situation that we find ourselves in or the situations in life that we find ourselves in. Guys, the foundation of faithfulness comes from understanding what has been won for us in the death and especially in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I came across uh, this story 
Uh, it was told by a man by the name of Viktor Frankl. He was, uh, he was a, a prisoner in a concentration camp in probably one of the most well-known concentration camps in Auschwitz. And he wrote a book uh, that was called Man's Search for Meaning. And, and he had this to say, and I want you to just listen to this. He talked about this concept of, of, of hope and how people, certain people hold on to hope and some people just have a very false hope. He says, some of the prisoners responded to their hopeless situation by becoming brutal and by becoming cruel themselves, partly because they were bitter, partly because they wanted power. Others, Frankel said, just, just gave up. And he wrote this. He says, usually this happened quite suddenly. The symptoms of which were familiar to us experienced camp inmates. We all feared for this moment in our friends. Usually it began one morning when the prisoner simply refused to get dressed or to wash or to go out to the parade grounds for inspection. No entreaties, no blows, no threats had any effect on these people. They just lay there. They had given up. Nothing bothered, bothered them anymore because they had no hope. Many of the people, he goes on to say, actually held on to hope that if they stayed alive their health, their family, their professional achievements, their fortune, their position in society would be restored to them when they got back home. But unfortunately, these people got out of these concentration camps, went back home and found that everything was in shambles. Everything had been stripped and taken away from them. So many people went into a, a very deep depression. Many people actually committed suicide, took their own lives and, and, and just gave up, he says. Frankel said that the ones who truly overcame the concentration camps were those who had a fixed reference point beyond the world, something that they held onto that was outside of the grasp of death and destruction. In fact, he said this in such an important and a big line. He said, life in a concentration camp tears open a soul and exposes its depths and its foundations. And guys, that's exactly and essentially what Peter is saying here in 1 Peter chapter 1. Trials and pain expose exactly where our hope is. And for many of us, our hope is simply that our circumstances will change. Just get me out of this, Lord. And when they don't, we despair and we give up. And slowly but surely, small and then large parts of us begin to, to die. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, where in the world is our fixed reference point that Peter talks about, that so many authors of the New Testament talk about, that so many authors of the entire Bible talk about, that Frankel talks about here in his book, The Meaning, or Man's Search for Meaning. Where is that fixed reference point? Guys, it is the resurrection. Something glorious, something wonderful, something beyond the scope of this world. Something that is so glorious that it makes all the pain and all the confusion and all the frustration and all the disappointment worth it. And guys, what I think we really need to say to ourselves when it comes to the end of everything is exactly what Peter would say in the letter that he wrote to these first, these first Christians, these early Christians. And, the, and, and here's what we need to say to ourselves. I don't belong here. I am only an alien and a stranger and a foreigner in this world. And, and this morning, guys, whatever emptiness, whatever hopelessness you might have in your life, God has completely taken that and transformed that through his resurrection. And what I want to offer you this morning is the power of that resurrection. Scripture tells us that the very same resurrection power who raised Jesus from the dead could, could be inside of us too. That we could have it at our disposal. But guys, that only comes as you, pay, you place your faith in Jesus Christ. As you, as you lay aside everything else in life and you say, strip me of everything else in life. I want you, Jesus, to be my Savior and most importantly, to be my Lord. That if, if that's you this morning, if you've never come to a faith relationship with Jesus Christ and you've never fully given your life over to Jesus Christ, there is a moment for you to do that right now. Wherever you're watching, whether you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube or you're on our online church platform, I want to ask right now that you would just lay it all aside. That you would hold on to the hope of Jesus' resurrection and you would allow that power to flood into your life. 
If you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on YouTube, we have in the description uh, right there that you can click on a link that will, will allow us to know that you have committed to your, your life to Christ or you want to commit your life to Christ. It, it further allows us to get into contact with you and to continue walking with you through the decisions that you will be making uh, over the course of the next coming days and weeks and months and years of your life. If you're on the online church platform, there will be a moment that pops up here in the chat uh, where you can just simply click on it and it will show that you're raising your hand uh, to make a decision to commit your life to Christ. Guys, there is nothing in your life that you can do that is more important than giving it to Jesus. In moments right now where you don't know where things are going to end up, where things are going to land, and when things are going to stop spinning out of control, and when we'll all be able to come back together again and be, guess what? We could, we could just sit and we could just stew in our emptiness every day of our lives, couldn't we? Or what we could do is we could set that aside for a moment and we could rejoice in the emptiness of a grave, of a tomb over 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked out of it and said, I'm coming back again, and I'm coming for all of those who have hope and have placed their faith in me. Again, if that's you this morning and you need to make the decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, that you would do that this morning and that we would be able to rejoice with you. We would be able to be in contact with you and be able to walk with you through that moment. Guys, my hope this morning, my joy this morning is if you would have joy, if you would have hope, in this moment today, that everything else you do for the rest of the day would be colored with the truth and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Lord, we do pray that. We do make that our hope. We do make that our foundation, our rock solid foundation. But Lord, you came into this world and you lived a perfect life. You went to death, you died on a cross, for our sins. And then when all seemed hopeless and all seemed lost and the moment seemed darkest, you were doing your best work. And that Sunday morning, you walked out of that grave and you gave every person from there forward the hope and the joy that you are in control and that we can have new life in you. And so I pray this morning that we would walk in new life, that we would not just say we have new life, not just say that we have hope, not just say that we have joy, but we would walk in new life today and every day of our lives. That if there are those this morning who do not know you and have not placed their faith in you, who do not know hope, do not know joy, do not know the power of resurrection life, Lord, that they would Feel it this morning, experience it this morning, but not just feel and experience and have that emotion, but know it deep down into their souls, every fiber of their being, to their core, that the truth is that you are alive. We thank you for that, Lord. We rejoice in that. All joy, glory, and honor to you. To Jesus' name, pray these things. Amen. What's amazing about the resurrection is that God could have let Jesus stay in the tomb. He could have been there. He could have been dead. But no, God showed his power over all, over everything, by rolling that stone away and raising Jesus up from the dead, out of that tomb, to prove that he had power over our sin, that he had power over our lives, that he had power over death itself. Even though the resurrection happened over 2,000 years ago, it still impacts my life today because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and destroyed the grave set me free to live a life that destroys sin. My sin debt is paid. I can live a guilt-free life as I follow Jesus, serving Him by loving God and loving others. The resurrection allows me still to gain wisdom from God's Word and to be guided by the Holy Spirit, the great comforter that Jesus promised to send Christians after His ascension. My resurrected Savior, through the power of the Holy Spirit, allows me to live a peaceful life in Christ that reflects the fruit of the Spirit. 
The resurrection impacts my life by assuring me that Jesus paid my debt and set me free. It gives me hope, hope for living my life daily, and most importantly, it gives me hope for the future. It gives me assurance of eternal life, and I know that I am God's child, wholly forgiven, covered by grace, and empowered to do great works for His people. God so loved the world.